This is a man, folks, who probably has forgotten more about golf than you are likely to learn. And he has the coolest beard in the industry. He's Matthew Rudy. Matthew, how are you? You know, I'm doing okay. The sun's out in October, so it's a, it's a win. <laughs> For the folks who are listening on audio, this beard is stupendous. Tell me how long you've been working on that thing there. I started working on it before COVID, uh, the November before COVID. And then when they closed everything down, I didn't have to go anywhere. Yeah. It was really easy to keep it. And because the hair on the top of my head doesn't grow so well anymore now, it's a, you know, it's, it's my one vanity project in the upper half of my body. And my, my wife loves it. And anytime I've threatened to cut it off, I used to have it down ZZ top length. Yeah. So uh, the, the concession to summertime and, and to not be 150 degrees on my face is to keep it more kind of four inches, five inches long. But it's uh, my, my, my middle daughter is nine. And she said, if I cut it off, she wouldn't recognize me when I went to pick her up from school. So I guess I have to keep it now. <laughs> okay. Audio listeners, you have to go to YouTube, just search Mark Immelman and you can see Matthew. Okay, Matthew, before we get into the meat and potatoes of this, um, Let's introduce you. You know, to me, you're the guy that I've always wanted to write a golf instructional article alongside. Uh, for the uh, for the viewers, listeners around the uh, globe, please share the the bio, the quick whistle stop. Sure, sure. I I went to Michigan State and I got out, and my uh, my first job was at a little basketball magazine in Michigan, and then I switched to Golf Digest as a golf reporter. And I did that for a few years, but the bulk of my career, I think going on 23 years, 23 years now has been mm -hmm. writing mostly golf instruction, ghost writing golf instruction with players and coaches like yourself. Um, my job is to go listen to, to coaches and players and, and take what they say and, and, and present it in both in magazine form, video form, you know, web, you know on our website, wherever it happens to, to show up or in the 30 some books that I've, I've written with, with players and coaches translate what what experts say into things that the average person can digest and hopefully use in their game and uh that that's been my my uh my full the, the full-time thrust of my profession for going on a quarter century now which makes me feel much older than i actually am i think well look you are an expert at it because the bits that i've done as columns and, and now with the uh, you know, I've done ebooks and stuff, but now with this book I'm writing, um, you the expert because you can condense the information in a way that not just uh, portrays and delivers the message, but so oftentimes, uh, you know, when it comes to condensing words, sometimes stuff is lost in translation. But everything I read of yours, I'm like, man, he's at every single point over there. And for the user and folks, I recommend you go and check his stuff out. All the books, all 30 of them plus. Um, it's, I read it, I, I understand it, it settles, it's galvanized, and then it becomes action points. And that's where I commend you. And I, I love the work you do. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, the, the challenge started for sure back in 1999 or 2000 when the only outlet was the printed magazine. There's finite space. So I would, I would go spend time with a coach or with a player and somebody would have a big, long um, explanation. And, and Johnny Miller is a perfect example. A lot of the first projects I did were with him and he knows, he knows more than any of us put together about the golf swing. And he has a lot, a lot, a lot to say. And the reality is you only have a certain footprint that, that yeah. the information can fit in and you have to, to prioritize just as you would if you're on the lesson to you with someone, you're picking the first thing that needs to go in there in their in their mind to, to work on and and you know what's the what's the first most most important thing and then what comes next and so I think it it caused a chain reaction of things in my career where you kind of have to learn to prioritize information and and also keep it in the voice of the person you're dealing with the uh, you know I might be the only one who notices but it matters to me if an article I do with you sounds like you and one I do with Mark Blackburn or Mike Jacobs or Ernie Els or whoever sounds like them. And I mean, that, that's really where the, the, the satisfaction in my work comes from. It isn't even so much the byline stuff. It's that the people you deal with, when something comes out, they say, man, that, that, that sounds exactly like me, but it's, it's more organized than I would have been able to do it on my own. I mean, that, that's what I'm after in the work that I'm doing. Well, Johnny Miller is in <laughs> this book, which is 
Matthew's second one ever published. The first one was Golf for Dummies. Um, so we're going to talk about this in a minute and five some five outlying swings that I love that you got to work with these guys. Um, but before we go there, here recently on Instagram, um, there was something by you on, I think it was on the Golf Digest page. There was six myths that <laughs> ostensibly could be sort of ruining your game. And this is right up my alley because... I call it grill room golf tips and the world of golf is rampant with them. And yeah, you hit six topics right in the forehead and you debunked all of them, which, which to me was a very cool piece. Well, it, that one came, uh, one of my buddies, Mike Jacobs, the golf coach, he's, he's really into the science behind how things work in the swing. And, and we're always having some of these kinds of information, informational, uh, we call them information sessions where, you will hear something in a broadcast or you, you hear something that a coach says and you, you kind of parse out where it came from and, and how it translates into what average people are trying to do with their swing, you know, holding lag down through the ball, those kinds of things. You know, there's a lot of euphemisms and a lot of, you know, kinds of turns of phrase that have happened through golf instruction through the years. And I think people, when they go try it their even their concept of trying it, makes it harder for them to to play golf and so this story was a mixture of those golf instruction ideas but also some of the 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 procedures that you might think when you know when you see a player for example toss grass up in the air when they're trying to assess what's happening with the wind a buddy of mine is a is a world champion sailor and he texted me one time and he says i'm watching the masters and i can't figure out why the players are tossing the grass in the air because you know, if you're a sailor, everybody knows that the action is happening way up above, you know, where the ball is going to be. It's, it's, it's completely different than where you're tossing the grass. You're actually giving yourself, I mean, having no information would be better than having that information. Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, if, if all it ever does is speed up play a little bit. So people are tossing grass in the air. I've, I've done my service for the, you know, for, for the golf economy and another great one is when you hear the the putts breaking toward indio on a broadcast or oh you know all the putts break toward the las vegas strip or they break toward, you know they break away from that mountain over there uh I, I talked to bobby weed the the architect and 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 he said something that i suspected which is you're building all these green complexes to have a drainage point mm -hmm. and the reality is the putts break toward the drainage the the central drainage point on the green so Instead of looking in the distance and seeing Mount Everest and saying your putt's going to break away from Mount Everest, you're better off walking up to the green from the front and looking for where the, the, the green drains. And that's the prevailing break. Yeah, those are the first two. I, I want to just kiss them one more time sure. because as an on-course announcer for CBS, you know, we lay out when players and caddies start talking. And I've always found it somewhat comical when the caddy will go, wait for your wind. And I was like, dude, <laughs> I mean, who are you, Jesus? I mean, yeah, yeah. no one knows whether you, you know where the prevailing wind is going. Right. That's why I would advocate that all of yours listeners have a wind map. So you look at the weather right. forecast and it's like it's coming from the southeast and you draw that across the golf course. But this stuff bounces around between the trees all the time. It, it does. And, and my friend, the point he made in the article is he says, if, if you're going to look at something, Look at the flagpole on the top of the clubhouse for the yeah. prevailing wind for the day. And mm -hmm. that can broadly inform something you might need to know. But but this idea, and, and a lot of it comes too, I think, from the lore of the Masters, for example, where you're walking up. And you'll even hear players say, well, I, you know, when I saw the pin, you know, going through Amen Corner, I was looking at, you know, the, the trick is to look at the pin in one place and then later on, you know, what's happening. And, and, and there might even be some little shred of, value when you're tiger woods but if you're a 10 handicapper and we're playing and you're like you said if, if, if i if we're playing together and you're a 10 handicapper and you're telling me you're waiting for your you're, you're waiting for your your win before you play that might be the last time we play golf <laughs> yeah folks and the truth is with a modern day golf ball if you just strike this thing solidly it flies better through the wind than it ever used to it does the, true, the, true. the second myth with the landmarks um, I hear you because, you know, water's going to run down a hill. It's just like a golf ball. But there are certain places that I've worked at, like Augusta National, for argument's sakes. Everything mm -hmm. sort of filters towards Race Creek down there. Right. By. And at Torrey Pines, you know, you've got the big ocean there and it goes down there. But folks, you have to look at the complex, the green surface you're on. You can't just look at a right to left and say, well, it's breaking the other way because the ocean's on that side. 
Right. I, I think it oversimplifies the green reading process. And, and I think the reality is most players don't read greens. Players remember greens. So if, if you're if you're a club member, for example, you're not really reading that putt on the 17th green. You've just hit that putt a lot. And so you know what it does. And actually the 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 act of learning aim point or, or going through a process where you look for where, where the drains are in the green and you and you crouch down and you and you understand what's actually making the putt break. That's where caddies earn their money because they're helping read a fresh green surface as opposed to saying, well, you remember the last time we played this hole, this is what that putt did or watching the ball, watching you know, your, your playing partner hit one and, and, and basing your read off of what you saw the other putt do. Yeah. The, the real artistry comes from being able to read the surface independent of the landmarks 50 miles away, but you're actually looking at the surface in front of you. And I, I think that's the skill that's important to learn. Yeah, and I were, along those lines, I would just come in on the heels of what Matthew says there and go, look, really pay attention to the color of the surface because you know, the faster it is, the more it's going to break. Right. Because the ball has more time for gravity to influence it. Mm -hmm. the, it the shine, yeah, the shine on the green. You know, are, are the blades laying toward you or away from you? There's a lot of tricks like that. You can go look at the cup and see you know, with, with the ragged edge of the cup versus the clean edge of the cup gives you an idea of kind of the prevailing way that the grass right. lays down. Um, you know, th those things are, are the one, those tricks are the ones you want to take from the veteran players and the veteran coaches. And um, even, even some of the, 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 the cheatery tricks, I was, I was doing a story last year about the, the ways players cheat and one top 50 coach who shall remain name, nameless gave me the one I never heard before, which is, when you go to mark your ball, drag the ball on the grass away from the mark because it creates a little rut in the ground. And if you have a short putt, the ball will stay in that little trough and go straighter. I had never even heard that one before. That's, that's probably more useful than knowing where Indio is. <laughs> Amen, brother. All right. Uh, that's the first two of six, the myths that might be ruining your game. The next one is what I call Advil for the golf swing. Everyone... <laughs> has Advil, everyone, Tylenol, whatever you use, everyone doles it out judiciously. Um, and in golf, it's keeping your head down. Yeah. <laughs> Do elaborate, please. Because yeah. if I, you, you've seen it, I've seen it countless times. If someone hits a bad shot, it's like, you didn't keep your head down. Right. You didn't keep your eye on the ball. So off you go. I think what, what immediately springs to mind is if you see a still photograph, for example, of uh, Justin Thomas, you know, at impact, you know, where he's, he's, he's leaning like this and he's kind of on his toes. If you look at that still photograph and you don't understand the dynamic action that's behind it, you would think that the key to hitting it far as a smaller person is to keep your head down and jump off of the ground as you're coming down toward impact. And bo both of those things, if you actually did that, you would be as far away from the dynamic movement that a player like Justin Thomas is creating in the golf swing, you would swing probably slower than you do now. And, and the, the, the problem with the head down is advice, especially for someone who's not a professional athlete and you know, none, none of us are, we, don't, we have a hard time creating speed and dynamic motion in the golf swing anyway. And so anything you do to lock your head down, to, to, to restrict yourself, restrict your body like that, Number one is slowing down everything that, that's happening in your swing. And the other thing you're doing, it, it's important, you're trying to restore this club in your hand to its, its full length down by the ball. Mm -hmm. And anything you're doing to, to bring your upper body closer to the ground and, and you're know, shortening your, your arms and shortening the distance from, the, from your hands to the, to the ground, you're, you're changing that, the length of that lever and you're going to crash the club into the ground at a different place than you want to. So anytime someone tells you that you're because you topped it, it's because you lift it up or you, you know, you, you I think the, the best way to describe it, um, what did I just read? It was, uh, it, I think it was Monty Scheinblum. He was talking about um, if, 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 if you hear your, your brakes squeaking, then the answer is you should turn your radio up louder. You know, you're, you're applying the wrong solution to yeah. a, to a problem in your golf swing and, and that, uh, Advil or Band-Aid is a great way to describe it. Or, or Hank Haney's famous line, which I which I love. If you know, if you have a broken leg, putting a bandaid on your arm isn't going to fix your broken leg. And I think that's exactly what you know. Hey, keep your head down. That that's that kind of advice. Yeah, folks, the head down 
thing I would just add to what Matthew says there. You know, understand that your head is a big bowling ball on the top of your spine, and your spine has a huge influence, the angle thereof of of your ability to land the club in the right place. You watch the pro go the pro golfers, you've seen it. How if they've got an adverse lie or an uneven lie or just a difficult shot, right? They make a few practice swings and they almost calibrate themselves to where the ground is because you get the club under the ball, the ball's aerial. Mm -hmm. You've seen that, yes? Absolutely. And I, th th there's there's any number of, of biomechanical studies that people far smarter than me have have done that, that show exactly what you've just said, you know, the, the interplay in the segments of your body. Mm. Uh, when you watch a, a, a player, anytime you see something that produces tremendous speed that looks quote unquote effortless, it's because the players understand the way the segments of the body work together. And anything, anytime you're trying to impose some specific assignment on say your, your head, your head, it ends up being your neck and the upper part of your body, your, you know, the top of your chest. Uh -huh. you've, you've essentially pulled all those things out of this chain that's creating an effective golf swing. Anytime you watch Rory hit the ball, or you watch Ernie Els back in the day hit the ball, there's no restrictions in those golf swings. There's no artificial, you know, freezing up of anything or keeping something in the, in the, in the same place. It's about creating that, you know, you know cracking a whip and creating dy dynamic motion. It's not restricting or shutting something down. Love it. Right. Let's whistle through these so we can get to one of my favorite books that's right next door to me. It's on my bedside table, by the way. Um, you don't create backspin the way you think. <laughs> when I saw this, I did giggle. So please uh, elaborate. Well, the, we've all seen the players hit wedge shots, you know, tour players specifically where they take a big pelt. Yeah. Uh -huh. divot. Divot. And I think the instinct many amateur players have is to think, well, the, the creation of the divot is what's creating the spin. And so you'll see somebody chop down the ball like they're using an ax to cut a hole in the ground. And if you make contact with the ground on that chopping motion before you get to the ball, you've just put a two inch wide pelt of grass in between and turf in between your club and the ball. And you've prevented the thing that creates backspin, which is the friction between the club and the ball. You, you've, you've blocked that from actually doing what you needed to do. So the, the chopping down action is not spin producing. It's clean contact with the club that is spin producing. So, I mean, you can watch someone like Tiger nip 50, 60 shots in a row with, with a wedge and create incredible spin and, and barely even bruise the grass. You know, it's not, it's the, the divot action is not the spin producer. Yeah. It's the clean contact that's the spin producer. And to build on your clean contact, um, folks, this is like a bugbear of mine, bugaboo of mine in the biggest way. It just makes my eyes want to spout blood. Dirty golf clubs. Golly, <laughs> man, when you watch the professional golfer, when he or she has to really fizz one, they're in there and they're making sure that those grooves are clean people. Don't leave your clubs dirty. Yeah, and not only that, they've been to the trailer before the round and gotten a new a new club. In addition to the club being clean, they have that extra advantage that that we don't have. And um, and and you watch, it's this beautiful. I mean, I call it a flat spot. It's not really a flat spot, but it's that you know, it's the, the club is sliding along the ground. I'm I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be able. I'm going to be playing with Stan Otley here in a couple of days, and when you watch him hit these kinds of shots, we did a story. Uh, must be 10 years ago now, where he proved that you could set the ball on pavement, you know, in the driveway. And if you have the right technique, you can glide the club across the pavement in the driveway and, and produce any kind of height or any kind of spin you want. And the divot is irrelevant. So the moral of the story is, as you said, make sure the grooves are clean, get a new get new wedges if you can, A, B, make sure that the, 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 the grooves are clean and then C, if you do get them dirty, and we all mess up and make you know, make a mess and, and the clubs get dirty, clean them off regularly. You can even use one of those little brushes. I did a shoe with Scotty Scheffler earlier this year and Scotty hanging on his belt loop and his pants when he practices has one of those little brushes. If it's cool enough for Scotty Scheffler to have a metal brush hanging on his pants when he plays golf, you can have one of those too. It's okay. Cleaning them between every shot. Hey folks, and try the age old one, Harvey Pinnock used to have basically a weed cutter, a blade on the bottom end of a shaft. 
mm-hmm. just make you go out there and swing back and forth and just clip the grass as you swung through. You do Great that. advice. Great yeah. advice. Right here, people. Yeah, we go five of six, tee it high and let it fly. <laughs> go. I spent some time with Bernie Najar. He's the um, the teacher at Caves Valley. He, he coaches Kyle oh, Bertrand. Yeah. yeah, he's the world long drive champion. And when you watch Kyle, the I mean, he might as well have the ball teed up on a pencil, you know, a, a scorecard pencil. It's so high up and, and he's got it, some tilt to his shoulders and he's trying to launch the ball into space. But when average players try to copy that and they get that ball really forward, and they get the, this a lot of shoulder tilt and they kind of swing over the top like a lot of players do, you know, you're hitting up on the crown of the club with sometimes an open face. I mean, you're, you're, you're actually producing way more of the, the worst kind of spin you can produce on your shots and in your attempt to accentuate a completely different kind of shot. You're, you're better, you're much better off placing the ball in a more neutral ball position and having a more neutral shoulder tilt because you're trying to accentuate hitting the center of the face, mm-hmm. even if you, if that's at the expense of a few, you know, a few less miles per hour of club head speed, the better contact is going to produce longer tee shots for you. I'm so glad you said that. And this is the second time you've mentioned it because you know, the internet is awash with what the, <laughs> the, the, um, the phrase of the day is right. An early extension for a while. And then it was wrist flexion. And I mean, it's in and out and they're like fashions. Um, and, you know, you mentioned, uh, well, ground reaction forces and folks are bouncing off the ground to try and hit it farther. I've never seen more folks miss hit drives and just spit their balls all over the joint than, than ever, as opposed to, like you say, just leveling off the base of the arc and striking a thing square. And, and when you see the, the other thing that is a great part of Mike Jacobs's research is, is what he keeps trying to reveal in this research and then ultimately... With, the, with coaching of players, and he coaches Patrick Harrington, and look at the club at speed that Patrick Harrington yeah. has managed to unlock these days. Everything you're seeing a player do that's an effective way to produce speed is the end of a chain reaction that happened much earlier in the swing. So when you're watching somebody like Justin Thomas look like he's jumping off the ground, the action that he, that the, 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 the force in his swing and, and what he's been doing to create that outcome of looking like he's coming up and, and jumping at the ball that happened way back almost when the club was in transition so yeah. if you're trying to look at a static photograph or or do kind of an armchair analysis of what you should be doing and your jumping is starting to happen when you're getting down by the ball it's it's too late you know the game is already over so mm-hmm. if you're going to try to incorporate some of these things in your swing you have to understand when the chain reaction starts to happen so that you can get this to happen when it needs to. I mean, the, the club face is another great example. And I think we're going to get to that a little later when we're talking about Paul Azinger. But, yeah. you know, when when tour players get the club up to the top of the swing and, and they're trying to contend with what the club face should be doing, they're dealing with the club face up near the transition of the swing. Amateur players have the club face wide open and then are trying to do a bunch of stuff down by the ball. The effective weight of the club down by the ball is 100 pounds. So if you think about trying to take a 100-pound thing and do something to it fast down by the ball, it's too late. Yeah. You want to be doing your stuff to the club up when it's the you know, quote unquote the lightest, which is up when it's moving the slowest and you know near your transition. That's an awesome take. Um, now that's the club, and we're gonna talk about Zinger in a minute. Um, but as the final myth, because I'm a big one <laughs> for most club golfers was watching this or listening to it. Uh, is just to go with low hanging fruits, and, and and I very much subscribe to Bob Jones, who said the key to golf was to turn three strokes into two. Yeah, when you're around the green, you know, pitch it one closer. If you're good at shot number three, you're going to lower scores. Um, and you've talked about breaking putts and reading them properly, and then the final one is about plumb bobbing, which right. does kind of look cool. Uh, it it might have been replaced a little bit on tour with aim points. Right. But you did make the point about plumb bobbing. So kiss that before we move along, please. Sure. I, when you plumb bob, ostensibly you're trying to use a straight edge, you know, your putter hanging in space to ascertain basically what the horizon is doing and the horizon being the putting surface. Mm-hmm. So can you see, you know, can you see a some kind of tilt in the putting surface by using, you know, by plumb bobbing with your putter? The issue, of course, is if you have a 20 footer, even if you were somehow to ascertain some kind of change in the horizon or, you know, the, some utility with the, with the plumb bobbing, you're catching the, 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 the break 
at the beginning of your putt when the ball is moving the quickest and actually has the least amount of impact on how the ball breaks. What you need to be figuring out, the ball is going to break much more dramatically down by the hole when it's moving more slowly. Yeah. And so at best, pump plumb bobbing, if you're doing it from behind the ball, is giving you a piece of information at the time when it's least useful for you to know it. So if you're going to plumb bob, go around behind the hole and do it that way, A, or, or B, getting back to what we were talking about before, maybe just learn how to read greens. And, and some of the best ways to read greens, even if you don't subscribe to Aimpoint, is to read with your feet. Uh, and a great example of that, if you're driving in a cart and you pull, you know, you come screaming up next to the hole like you're supposed to instead, and you hop out because you want to play fast, when you walk from the cart over to the green, you're not seeing anything about the green complex. You can't really understand some of the prevailing break. The best thing you could do would be to walk up from the front of the green with your head up so you can see everything with the bunkers and with the green complexes and you can see kind of the full context of the putt that you're going to be facing and your computer your brain is a very sophisticated computer you're filling up your brain with this you know the the, the context information around what you need to to do if you if you just get up there and stand behind the ball and hold up the putter to plumb by it it's it's a very limited piece of information that doesn't have a lot of utility yeah, I would, I would almost advocate for most folks listening to this is take the grand of you. And once you have that in the back of your mind, then you can go macro on the thing. Cause I like you, you know, when the golfer is down in the fairway, I'm like, look at the target down there. You can see where the thing's tilted toward. And when you get there, don't fall in love with what you're looking at right over here. Bear in mind what you've got in the back of your mind and then go with what you're saying. And I'm guessing that's, you're okay with that observation. For sure. And I've been really fortunate to do, I think, seven books now total with Stan Utley and Dave Stockton mm -hmm. and, and to hear all kinds of great short game and putting advice from, from the coaching side, from the, from the you know, successful Thanks. tour player side, you name it. And one of the coolest things Dave, Dave Stockton describes is if you're looking at a putt, and you read it from the low side, it's like you're looking, you know, if you're holding up a book in front of you, you know, you're holding a book up like this, reading it from the low side, you're looking at the putt in a way that you can see the, the pages of the book. And when you when you walk around to the high side and try to read it, you're trying to read the book with the, the you know, when, when it's pointed away from you. That's so just, just that piece of information, yeah. I think, gives the average player, a, 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 as you said, a much more macro and micro view of what they're dealing with. And even if you don't make the right, the, the, the perfect read, your, your mistakes and your misses are going to end up much closer to the hole and you're going to produce less drama on the putt coming back. Yeah. And the truth is if you just eliminate or lower your three putt percentage, your putting numbers are going to improve anyway. Sure. All right, let's get to the book. Um, I glowed about this. I reached out to you a long time ago to do this. I'm finally getting around to it. For the folks on YouTube, there it is. It's a Golf Digest Matthew Rudy publication. It's Vintage. Swing, the secrets of the game's greatest golfers. Now, as a preamble to this, Golf Digest, I'm, I'm, I'm stealing your thunder. For the longest time, you guys had to have, used to have that stretch of swing sequences where it was all the greats and you'd break them down and as a younger guy i'm 53 and fabulous now um th they were like big full spread like a four pages and i cut every single one of these things out and i stored them in a binder and to this i've still got them in like plastic sheets then i moved to the states and i found this book in barnes and noble i'll never forget and i got it and everything was just together and um there's some i mean it's incredible the list of players you referenced miller he's in you bob jones ben hogan all of them, Sarah's and uh, it's, it's just a treasure trove of information for folks who want to look and learn. Um, so I've, I've picked out some outliers and I'm going to toss them to you and just have you comment and say, look, when you go and get this book or when you look at these swings and they are stills, yes, you made a good point about, you know, this is a moving sculpture and yeah. just fall in love with one picture. We don't get the overall context, but there's a lot that still can be learned. And that's yeah, why. And, I and, and I, and I was and when you texted me to to ask to do this, I, I broke out some of the old, the, you know, the the source material for the book, and and I got and you were talking about this, the still images. I got one of these boxes out, and this this box right here is a th this. These are individual slides. That's one golf swing. 
That's oh, one. That's one swing swing sequence. All these, you know, there's there's probably I don't know a good fifty slides that's in there. That's in there, yeah. So that's this is this this is Tom Kite, Tom Kite swing, and so the the old cameras that we used to use the whole the, the, kid, the, like, the kids like, watching this on YouTube are like, what the hell are those things? <laughs> <laughs> and so we would shoot. We it was this big long roll of film, and it would sound like a gun going off, and they would and, and you you'd get a whole set of these. And then when you look at the swing sequence book, my job was to actually take the roll and strip it out mm -hmm. and find the, the eight positions that you see in the book and cut the, cut the negative so that you could see the different positions in the swing. And I mean, I, I, that was just my moment of time. And the ones that I was doing there, you know, there were three or four that I was responsible for in that book doing myself, and then going back through the years. But that was the procedure even back into you know, the 70s. Yeah. To, to pick these swing sequences out. And so the ambition with this book and with these swing sequences through the years was to try to present, you know, these community swing positions that were that were standard from player to player. The, the time in the swing was standard. And then you could compare and contrast the positions relative to each player to see what was similar and what was different. So the, the goal for the book and the goal for the articles that we do and again, you get, this is going back 20 some years where we definitely didn't know as much about the, the, the biomechanical pieces, you know, the way energy was being created. I mean, I cringe now to think of how many times I wrote or a coach wrote, you know, you got to hold the leg as long as you can down to, you know, th things that we know now that are, are not as accurate as they, as, as we thought they were. But, but the goal was to give people things that they could compare and contrast and then ultimately what they could take away for themselves. Well, look, the uh, looking at this, because when I was a young man, I was a voracious reader. And in South Africa, we didn't get Golf Digest every month or week or whatever it was. Um, so I used to get them when I could. They, we didn't have great teachers down there with love. Um, wasn't much television stuff. So this is kind of how I learned. So I would read a, lo a lot. And I was, I got the Modern Fundamentals, you know, the, the Ben Hogan book from David Frost. And I was a very good player. The next thing I was swinging with my right elbow connected to my side and I hit the ball shorter and shorter until I saw your Davis love. And then I was like, mm -hmm. hold on, I can free this up a little bit. Yep. So I guess you can file this under, you know, things, no, there's nothing new under the sun and that there's more than one way, way to skin a cat. And he's all legends. Oh, sure. And, and as you go through the years too, it's fascinating because there's, there's, um, the further back you go, and using Ray Floyd as an example, um, the swings were much less similar back in the quote unquote golden era of tour golf, 60s, mm -hmm. 70s. And they might have become superficial, superficially more similar these days. And actually, I think it's a testament to the improvement uh, in the quality of golf instruction and, and more understanding about how um, energy is generated. Um, but to see, it, it's much more instructive, I think, to look at a Paul Azinger swing, for example, from the 80s or a Raymond Floyd swing from the early 80s or the 70s, because it that gives people hope that you don't have to be an elite athlete. You don't have to have a perfect body. You don't have to have a perfect swing to make an effective golf swing, as long as you understand the way the parts are working together. Yep. Okay. So let's start with Zinger, because I gave him <laughs> five. These are all outliers, folks. They all swing yeah. that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily have your child model. And yes, Zinger, and there's a quote in the book, because there's the entire sequence, I've got this one in my file, um, where Zinger must have said to you, I guess, 12 years ago, I'd never broken 70, and I couldn't break 80 two days in a row. Mm -hmm. That yeah. a major champion, one of the foremost voices in the game. So, so, so tell us something we can learn from Paul Zinger, please. Yeah, the, the thing that I'm sure jumps out to you when you're looking at it, and is like the, strong how, how strong yeah. the grip was and and i think that is something that should probably resonate with average players more than anything it's one thing to look at johnny miller with an extremely weak grip the reality is most most players if you tried to do that i think you'd hit it so far right it would come around and hit you in the back of the head yeah. um, azinger had an extreme strong grip and then the things he did in his swing were designed to to cool off the tendency to hit the ball to the left. You know, the he, he had a little more slide in his swing. You know, held off his release a little bit more to to prevent the ball from going left. And and I think what what he 
demonstrated is a very effective lesson for the average player, which is that there, there are trade-offs that you can make to be a more effective player. So he gave up height in his, in, in the shots that he could hit. He didn't hit it as far as other players, but he had a predictable ball flight and the, the grip that he had was reliable for him to produce a reliable shot shape. Yeah. And the other big thing is um, he didn't cave and there's, there's some really interesting stories about when he came out on tour, he felt very self-conscious about the way that super strong grip looked. I think he called it a motorcycle grip mm -hmm. <laughs> and he was very, he was very self-conscious about the way it looked and he contemplated changing it. And he got some really good coaching from John Redmond and, who said, if you come back here and tell me you're going to change your grip, or if you do change it, don't come talk to me because I'm not going to talk to you anymore. And, and I think a big part of being a professional and being a successful professional, and, and you can look at even some current examples, you know, what Roy McIlroy has gone through with some of his putting or what Jordan Spieth has gone through with his golf swing, or Victor Hovland is another great example of a guy who's succeeded because he's always kept breadcrumbs to know if he's getting new information from a coach, what you need to use and keep and what you can throw out. And, to, and the key to being a successful professional over the long term is being able to understand what the fundamental part of your swing is that works and keep it and not get away from something that makes the entire puzzle break apart. And, and you look at those Paul Azinger swings and I think if, if a run of the mill coach and that that's not a knock on coaches because I think the average coach in golf now compared to 20 years ago is much better. There's more information, there's better technology, there's more assets at your disposal. The average coach might have looked at that swing an 18 year old or a 20 year old who said, Oh, I want to play on the tour and would make dramatic yep. changes to it. And, and that's not always the answer. You are preaching. In fact, I'm hearing choirs of angels, um, <laughs> Reverend Rudy. Uh, yes. The thing is when I quit playing and I was always into teaching and stuff, I hooked up with someone and it was very much a method instructor. And I eventually I'm like, I can't be doing this because I'd become the victim of trying to swing a certain way as opposed to doing what I naturally did. And, and I love your use of the word breadcrumbs because oftentimes, and I admitted this to Ian Baker Finch here earlier this year, you know, who also fell foul to making changes. Sure. Right. And I was like, it's amazing now with the benefit of a few more years and some wisdom at the time when I was a young teacher and I really kind of knew my craft, I always thought that there was something more. And I certainly did so when I was a player. And if only I'd remained true to really who I was, it could have been a different time now. And all is sure. done with grand intentions. And it was the interest in the interest of improving. And that's where John Redmond was a legend with what he did with Zinger. Yeah. And I want to reiterate too, I'm not blaming coaches for making those changes. The players are responsible yeah. for deciding what to do or what not to do. And Oftentimes the player will come in and I've had this conversation with lots of top tour coaches here and over the last five, 10 years, players will come in and say, Oh, I see what player X over here is doing. And I need to get more of that in my game. I, this, you know, so-and-so is hitting it this much farther. I need more of that in my game. And the players are insistent that they need, you know, they need the elixir that's going to make their game different. And, the, what makes coaching such artistry to me is to be able to understand the knobs that you can turn to make changes with a player, but also have the bedside manner and have the wisdom to, to give the player what they need when they need it. And, and I, I was doing Hank Haney stuff in golf digest when Tiger was having his run with Hank and to watch that procedure and how delicate that kind of stuff was and, and, you know, the ability as a coach to say, all right, you know, I, how much of this do I need to give a player like Tiger? If I give him a hundred percent and he does 20%, what is that going to manifest in how he plays? Yeah. Do I need to give him 200% so he does the right amount? So you're always trying to drip the right amount of information into a student. And that happens on the lesson tee for a 20 handicapper, just like it happens for a tour player. And everybody, you know, the, the player is ultimately responsible for, for you know what happens on the scorecard but the, the 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 weight of that 
for a coach when it comes to a tour level player. That's somebody's livelihood. And that, I mean, the, the stress that comes, it comes with that kind of interaction. I think that's the story that probably doesn't get told enough. That's why I got on blood pressure medication working with elite uh, athletes. Folks, I, I'll leave you with this. If you went to your friend's house, you wouldn't go look in his or her medicine cabinet and just take whatever. No. Because you took whatever. Don't take another man's medicine. All right. Um, I've kept you for a long time. So I'm going to scoot past one of my favorites in Seve Ballesteros. And I'm going to move you to Ray Floyd. You mentioned him <laughs> earlier. Uh, here's the sequence, people who are watching on YouTube. Ray was one of my yep. favorites. And I will long remember that. The pointing of the finger and the bunker hole out sure. of Dark Hills. Um, Ray's was always Ray's. I remember when I was a young golfer coming up and Gary was kind of a mentor and and you'd I, the, the golf golfer, the aesthetic golfer in me and maybe the budding teacher in me was like, oh, no, this is not right. And yeah, Trevino. Trevino's, Ray, Trevino's but, it's the same when you talk about Trevino's. Until story. I saw him hit the ball. So uh, so, so, share something about Ray that, that, that stands out that could help people. I mean, I, I, one of, the, one of the, the crises about looking at swing sequence books as a, you know, somebody I, I've played golf my whole life and my, and my handicap, I was a mid single digits player when I started at Golf Digest and it's gone up every year for 23 years just because of all of the avalanche of information I had coming my way and not being a 25 year old man anymore. But, but the, um, the, the, the crisis of doing a swing sequence book is attempting to uh, metabolize or copy something that isn't appropriate for your flexibility, for your frame, for, for the way your body parts are put together. You know, Ray Floyd doesn't look like Rory McIlroy. Yeah. And there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. And Ray Floyd has relatively short arms. He's not, he has kind of a, more of a barrel chest. And, the, and his swing can be charitably described as coming over the top. But what, he, but what it proves is that you can have an over the top swing. You can be, you know, Bruce Litsky and hit a slice. I mean, you, you can do lots of things that don't look like the way Rory McIlroy hits a tee shot and you can win lots of matches, win lots of majors, win lots of points at the Ryder cup. If you understand the way your physiology or you know, the way your body works and your body comes together. And if, if I'm out there as a six foot six, 330 pound guy trying to create this big, huge, flexible, you know, width at the top of my backswing, like Rory McIlroy after a, you know, a year and a half after Achilles surgery and never being a very flexible guy ever. And I go out and hit grounders. I I'm, I, you know, I've, I've, I'm, I'm messing up. I'm not, I'm not serving my own golf game. So I think the, the answer there is to, is to pick a model that has the same relative build that you have and hits the same kind of shot the predominant shot shape that you hit because then you actually can find an avatar that you could conceivably get a little bit closer to and hit better shots. I love it. I'm writing, yeah, pick a good and appropriate model. This is for the show notes. Um, I want to pitch you this and we'll skip past Mo and get to Chi Chi to wind up, but I want to throw this to you because, you know, on the lesson T and I'm sure you've experienced it and I'm sure you've done articles on it where you ask a golfer what their goals are. And, and, you know, I was part of the Sony Handicam generation of instructors, right? You still, you still ask coming mm -hmm. with the, the bag over the shoulder and yep. swing videos and comparing you to Ernie or Tiger, whoever you had in your swing library. Um, and I think the good appropriate model is very, very important. But when people come to the lesson tee, they're like, what's the goal? And then they're like, I want to be more consistent. And my response is like, well, look, uh, what you really only can get consistent is your response to the shot you hit because golf's a mercurial game. Mm -hmm. and then I'm like, I'd rather you grade your golf swing by saying, look, whatever it does, does it hit the ball squarely? The lion's share of the time. Do you create maximum club head speed for minimum effort? And then does the thing repeat itself under pressure? Because you talk about Raymond Floyd and a modern day example maybe is a Jim Furyk. And I remember talking to Mike, his dad at the tour championship one year. I'm working with my brother and they're playing the practice around the gym. And I eventually pluck up the courage to say to Mike, look, man, I've got to commend you. And he laughed. He goes, why? And I'm like, because I can only imagine all of the commentary you heard as the father of this kid coming up with this golf swing. Yet you guys remain resolute to what he did. And now he's a potential hall of famer. 
And he started him off from scratch with a cross-handed putting grip. In addition to the, the there you go, nuggets, nugget of the day. <laughs> it's, I, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. And um, and I mean, the, the Mo Norman example that we were talking, we were texting about earlier, is a, is a, is a great example too. He had a grip that went you know this way in his hand. Uh-huh. It took he basically took the lever in his wrist out of his swing, and could hit every club in the bag as straight as you could point. And he was, he said, well, this is what works for me. And he, and he did it. And, you know, it's, uh, I don't know, the, 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 the picking the right avatar and, and, and you know, Chi-Chi's, Chi-Chi's another great example. We're talking about a guy who at the peak of his powers was five foot seven and 120 pounds. And you go back to, you know, persimmon era, He's playing against Jack Nicholas, who could pick him up and put him in his pocket. You know, or your Tom Weisskopf, who's you know six, six foot four. You know, these these big, long lever strapping guys who could hit it forever. And you know, when you look at what Chichi did, he had tremendous. He created this tremendous backswing turn on a very. He was very stable. You know, he, he when you look at still photographs, you know, there's 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 so much stability in what he's doing. That when you watch him, and especially because he, he would do kind of this almost Arnold Palmer like thing with his head mm-hmm. after he was done, mm-hmm. it made it look like he was lashing at it or he was out of control. But the reality was he was as stable. Uh, lost you for a second. There you got me. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, when you when you the reality is when you watch him, he's he was at you know he looked as stable as. Brett Hall waiting for the puck to come to, to hit a, you know, to shoot a one timer, mm-hmm. and you know, and when you watch those guys on skates, they have their skates turned sideways, and they're and they're pushing against the side of the you know the side of the blade on the ice, and are extremely stable, in what would seem to be a very unstable situation. And and when you look at Chichi, he produces this incredible club head speed and this really aggressive release, on a very stable base. When everything about your instinct as a smaller person, you know, if, if you were that size and and you said, "Hey, Chichi, I want you to go up there and punch that guy who's you know twice your size," you know, your instinct would be to try to lash out and be out of control and kind of you know flail and and it, it, you know he, he's able to crack the whip and understand that the, the handle of the whip has to be has to slow down for the head of you know for the tip of the whip to to swing fast. And what I think average players struggle with is they try to move their hands so fast that that never transfers the energy out to the end of the club. They yeah. never actually make the club, the, the whip crack. Go, go grab a top. Make it, make it go. Um, I lost you for a split second again there. I think we might be having inter- uh, internet ash- issues. Mm-hmm. But I love your analogy of the cracking of the whip and the journey of the handle versus the club head and how you create speed. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was going to add to this, you know, to sort of give you my take, as I look at your swing sequence, and without even looking at the commentary, the thing that jumps out at me is something I've always believed in, and that is a long movement of the body with a shorter arm swing where most of your club golfers have the shorter movement of the body and the arms travel a long way, again, to your observation, I guess, where you look at Chi Chi, that stability comes from his movement is, is so appropriate in the middle, but the arms never get out of control. So you can't right. crack that whip at the appropriate time. Yeah, and I think another piece too, with, and we're seeing it now with the research that, the, the, that uh, coaches are able to do on hub path, you know, where... The, the travel, if you take the spot where your hands go on the club, where this hub moves around you, mm-hmm. what good players, what, what the elite players do is they have the, they get that hub very far away from them yeah. in the swing. And the hub takes a direct curving route down to the ball. The worse you get at pulling that hub way behind you, the less time you have to get it in position where everything can start to move faster. Good players have lots of travel and time to make the hub go where it needs to go and time to make the head move fast. So what bad players are doing is they're costing themselves swing length and they're costing themselves time to be hitting the accelerator. Savvy had, or excuse me, Chi Chi had lots of time 
to hit the accelerator so that the head could be going maximum speed. And what Matthew says there, it's another swing in the book, is my buddy Ernie Else. It's the reason why someone, look, he's six foot three, he's massive. But someone as graceful as that, even Harris English, modern day or whatever, can create so much clubhead speed looking like they barely break a sweat. It's for that very principle. Exactly. They have Ernie has lots of time, lot, lots of time, to, and, and he's pushing the accelerator. You know, he's not, he's not coming up to the stop sign and just goosing the accelerator. He's, he's pouring on the speed all the way through this downswing, and he has, he has so much more time than you do to make it go fast. And, you know, I did Ernie stuff in golf digest for seven or eight years and to, to watch the amount of talent that that guy has and his ability to do things effortlessly. It, when you see people using their, their body and, and, and letting this chain, you know, let, letting the, the speed come out through the, the end of the chain effectively, you, you wonder how they could ever miss a shot. It's, it's amazing to watch. I mean, it's, it's, to me, it's more amazing. Even what he does physically is even more amazing than when, than when you watch tiger hit balls, tiger is an explosive athlete. And it's very impressive. Ernie, it just looks like he's, you know, just tossing the ball underhanded in a catch with his kids. It's, it's yeah. amazing. Um, uh, another sporting analogy. And I'll wrap with this about else. And I've always believed that swing width is a great savior. It helps with timing. Um, uh, a NASCAR racing around Bristol, versus Talladega they have the same engine mm -hmm. but both around Talladega or Indianapolis or whether one of the longer tracks Daytona they're going fast down the straightaway but you race around a short track in Bristol you just don't have the the time to create that speed to yep. use your firm time I think it's a great it's a great comparison too I mean and the I think the 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 hardest thing for a swing sequence book, for example, to communicate is that piece of it. It's how these moments in time connect. And I think that part, even if as the, the amateur, if you're trying to get in those positions, unless you can see the, the dynamic part of it and the savior now is if we, if we were going to do that book today, you could put QR yeah. codes in it or something and you could watch the videos at the same time. It'd be amazing. Well, I'm going to advocate that you do. Uh, for the folks that are like me, that are a bit old school, is this still available? Can people get it? And so where? <laughs> I think so. When you sent me the text, I had to see where mine was, and, and that that I think that's been in print. You know, it's, it, that that came out. I want to say 20, 20 some years ago. I think it's time to do a new one. We should when you're done with it. When you're done with this book, let's do a let's do a new edition and uh, talk about the the modern golf swings. I'll, I'll sign up for that one. Yeah, well, the picture of you in the back here, as I look at the uh, dust covers, there's no, there's there's hair on your head and no hair on your chin, <laughs> so that's time. Look, Matthew, this stuff's fantastic. Share with the people where they can find you, and also where because you got multiple books. I mean, Amazon. Do they just go search your name? Yeah, no, I, I did the Stan Utley books. I did the Dave Stockton books. I've, I've done books with Hank Haney. I've done books. Uh, you, uh, I do a lot of uh, ghostwriting for leadership type, you know, business type folks to you know, peak performance outside the golf world too. And, uh, but you, you can find me golfdigest.com is an easy place to find me. And, uh, my, my, you know, matthewrudy.com has all my books on there too. E, you are a legend of the game and I'm thankful that you would join us and share all your insights. Appreciate you. Uh, it's great to talk to you. Well, let's do it again.